sekarang aku sedang ada di MC Edu Park atau bisa disebut dengan Mega Cepu Edu Park. Dibangun di atas lahan seluas 11.000 meter persegi dan berlokasi di Jalan Golok Maju Kecamatan Cepu. MC ini adalah inovasi dari TPS Mega yang telah dibuka pada tanggal 31 Maret 2019. Rekan Migas akan dimanjakan dengan wahana edukasi dan wisata kemigasan untuk semua lapisan masyarakat loh. Nah, sekarang yuk ikutin aku untuk melihat apa aja sih yang ada di edupak ini. peralatan yang biasa digunakan di industri migas loh. Terus kalian juga bisa foto di sini juga. Uh, ini salah satu contoh dari 3D art pemigasan. Nah, uh, yang ada di belakang saya ini, terus yang di sebelah sana juga kalian bisa langsung foto-foto loh dan kita foto. Sekarang kita lihat yuk wahana tercover di MC Edupa. Ya inilah water boom. Lihatlah rekan migas sangat jernih airnya. Pengen cepat-cepat berenang ya. Seluncurannya juga loh. Ada yang untuk anak-anak dan juga untuk dewasa. Dan wajib dicoba sebuah makanan dari Wisma Supong Maju Resto yang akan memanjakan lidah rekan migas semua loh. Resto ini juga dihiasi diorama tentang sejarah migas loh. Contohnya seperti yang ada di belakang saya ini. Coba adalah ATV ini yang sedang saya pakai dilengkapi dengan mini zoo. Nah, keren kan dan seru kan rekan migas? Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon everyone. Hai rekan Migas, everywhere joining this Zoom meeting and watching on YouTube PPSDM Migas Official and Kementerian ESDM. Gimana kabar hari ini? It is a pleasure for us to welcome you to this webinar, Navigating the Perfect Storm, Implications for Indonesia. I'm Santi Oktaviani. And I'm Nova Fauzia. COVID-19 has been a great concern for everyone lately. It has given a tremendous impact across all sectors, tidak terkecuali industri migas. Seperti kita ketahui bahwa migas masih menjadi sumber energi dan sumber pendapatan utama di Indonesia. Tapi nih Kak Santi, beberapa waktu ini kita sering mm -hmm. dengar bahwa harga migas itu turun tajam. That's right. Mm -hmm. Jadi COVID has resulted in low demands for oil and gas combined with the already low oil prices. So, will oil and gas industry lose its charm among the investors? Dan bagaimana kelanjutan pengembangan industri migas ke depan? Termasuk bagaimana rencana pengembangan sumber daya manusia migas ke depannya. But don't worry because your questions will be answered in this webinar. We will discuss the impacts of oil price crisis and the COVID-19 pandemics in oil and gas industry and its implication toward human resources development. Bicara tentang pengembangan hmm. SDM Migas, pasti okay. ingat PPSDM Migas. Pastinya lah. <laughs> Oke, okay. PPSDM Migas is the center for developing your skills in oil and gas industry subsector. Dan kita mau ingetin buat rekan Migas bahwa starting from Monday, jadi besok Senin, we'll reopen our offline training and certification classes in Cepu. But I would like to remind you that you need to consider on the health protocols. And for those of you who wants to join our online trainings, mm -hmm. workshops, and certification, okay. maybe all of you may be worried about traveling. Please check our website on ppsdmigas.id and follow our official social media, Instagram, Twitter, Twitter Facebook, and, and YouTube. YouTube. As a trusted human resources development center of oil and gas, 
PPSD Migas has been accredited by Komite Akreditasi Nasional or KAN for Integrated Management System. There's even more. What LSP else? PPSD Migas adalah satu-satunya LSP milik pemerintah yang bergerak di subsektor migas mm-hmm. yang yeah. tidak hanya terlisensi oleh BNSP but we also accredited by Komite Akreditasi Nasional mm-hmm. melalui ISO 17024. So, please do not hesitate because our certificates are both nationally and internationally accepted. It is trusted. Okay. Well, uh, let us greet our speaker and presenters for today. Yang terhormat Kepala Pusat Pengembangan Sumber Daya Manusia Minyak dan Gas Bumi, Bapak Wahid Hasim. Selamat sore Pak Wahid. Sore. Bagaimana kabarnya Pak? Baik, baik Mbak. Oke. Oke. And the honorable today's moderator, mm-hmm. Bapak Florentino Suryo Susilo, the senior advisor of Arthur the Little South East Asia. The Energy and Utilities Asia Pacific. We are very happy to have you here and we are overwhelmed to see you in this webinar. Uh, you know what? Mm-hmm. Up to 2,000 people have registered in this webinar since we published it in our social media two days ago. Can you believe it? Wow, and the participants here come from various parts, mm-hmm. from oil and gas industries, government officials, universities, and those who take great interest in our topic today. And I would like to inform you that for those of you who find any problems in joining the Zoom meeting, you may also watch it live on our YouTube channel, PPSD Migas Official, or from the YouTube channel of Kementerian SDM. Before we start, let us pray first. Bapak Nur Halim akan memimpin doa. Disilahkan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om ya Tuhan kami, puji dan syukur kami panjatkan kehadiran atas kelimpahan nikmat. Okay, let's continue. As the head of PPSD Migas, Bapak Wahid Hashim will be delivering the keynote speech. Pak Wahid, disilahkan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Prosperous greeting for all of us and good afternoon. The Honorable Mr. Trangsi, Head of Arthur Digital Energy and Utilities Asia Pacific. Mr. Stephen Rogers, partner at Arthur Digital UK Energy and Utilities. Mr. Florentino Suryo Susilo, Senior Advisor Arthur Delital South East Asia, all participants of webinar on navigating the perfect storm, implication for Indonesia in this Zoom meeting, and all audience watching on YouTube PPSDM Mikas Official and YouTube Kementerian SDM. I feel greatly honored to be here with you to be, uh, with you this afternoon in, in one of the agenda of sharing 
the update on the recent situation, especially oil and gas industry, as the effect of the pandemic. I would like to extend our thankfulness to Arthur Delittle for the care and the cooperation so we can collaborate to organize this webinar hosted by PPSDM Gas. We do hope that this cooperation will be continued and may result in more intensive activity in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, the global oil and gas industry has been hit extremely hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. Indonesia is one of many countries experiencing major changes to their social and economic structure due to the pandemic. People have been forced to aggressively minimize social interaction in an attempt to prevent the spread of the virus. Inevitably, these measures will have a major impact on various business sectors. One of the sectors in Indonesia that has been forced to adapt to this unique situation is the oil and gas subsector. Indonesia is home to numerous oil and gas field and upstream oil and gas activities are integral to the country's economic growth. Oil and gas activities are generally considered essential activities by government and have been mostly exempt from the lockdown measures. In addition, the collapse in fuel demand caused by the pandemic mean countries across the global South South rating decision to let energy companies extract oil and gas. It is as a result of the reduction in road transport and air travel. It will not recover quickly, if ever, to the path it was on before the pandemic hit. Ladies and gentlemen, the government of Indonesia has suddenly begun the process the removing social distancing restriction subject to various health protocols. This process of moving past social distancing and re returning to workplace, school, and public activities is referred to as the new normal. Some options of future trend are being prepared and visible. What I would like to highlight is about what we can do to face the situation and its effect in our life in order to survive and optimize our potential. We have precious duties and responsibility for this. The equal important thing are the commitment, consistency, and seriousness in doing everything by determining our help for our beloved one. Besides, we also have to cons cons constantly maintain our competencies and professionalism that will be the result of our performance during and after the storm. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih Pak Wahid Hasim. Sekarang kita sapa dulu rekan Migas yang masih tetap stay tune baik melalui Zoom, YouTube channel Kementerian ESDM dan juga YouTube channel PPSDM Migas Official. Masih tetap semangat dan jangan lupa subscribe ya. I would like to remind you all about safety. So, selama mengikuti webinar ini, jangan lupa tetap memperhatikan tentang keselamatan, yaitu dengan memilih lokasi yang aman untuk mengikuti webinar ini. Okay. Dan juga manage untuk sound level, 
dan juga untuk fokus rekan migas semua. Jadi tetap bisa tanggap dengan cepat if there is any emergency situation. situation. Serta tidak disarankan ya untuk mengikuti webinar ini sambil menyetir. Karena bahaya berbahaya banget. banget oh, iya. Oke. Okay. Okay, before we get started, mm -hmm. let me inform you the rules of this webinar. To all participants, please make sure to mute your microphone, turn off your camera, and set your Zoom account name according to your real identity. Kenapa? Karena nama yang Anda gunakan akan digunakan sebagai data di e-certificate nantinya. And if you want to raise a question, Please submit it through the Q&A menu below your Zoom account. And also for those who join this webinar through YouTube channel, please put your comments in the chat section in YouTube. And we will have question and answer session later. Okay, I think we're ready to start this webinar. Okay, let's start the webinar. Navigating the perfect storm implications for Indonesia. And I would like to invite... Bapak Florentinus Suryo Susilo to moderate the discussion. Bapak Florentinus, would you please? Thank you. Oke, okay. terima kasih Bu Santi. Uh, <coughs> selamat sore Bapak Ibu sekalian. Uh, salam sehat buat kita semua. Terima kasih kepada Kementerian ESDM dan PPSDM yang telah memberikan kesempatan kepada kami untuk uh, sharing knowledge tentang uh, update dari oil and gas. Uh, before we start the discussion, I would like to greeting to the speaker. Uh, uh, good morning to our speaker from Melbourne, Australia, Trangi. Good morning. Good, good, good evening. Yeah, good evening. Hi. Okay, Thanks, everyone. Hi. And then I would like to greeting also to our speaker from London, UK. Good morning to Stephen Rogers. Good morning, sir. It's a bright good morning here. Okay. Uh, now, uh, before we start, uh, before we start the, the discussion, I would like to introduce uh, about Arthur Delito and also about uh, the speakers. Okay. Just ensuring everybody can see uh, the slides. Can you see the slide? Yeah, thanks, Lord. All right. Okay. So here we are. Uh, I would like to 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 ask your couple of minutes to introduce you about the uh, history of Arthur D. Little. This is very important. Why very important? Because we're talking about the credibility of the analysis and the credibility of the who are we the one that's sharing uh, for the discussion today. Uh, Arthur D. Little was founded in 1886. So uh, Arthur A. D. L. is the world's first strategy consulting firm. Uh, it was established in 1886 in Boston by Professor Arthur Down Little, so from MIT. And then afterward is that you can see in the slide that a couple years later, uh, there was establishment of a Bose and Co. Uh, Bose and Co. Uh, Later, now is uh, acquired by uh, PwC, and then afterwards, a couple years less later, there there was a uh, establishment of McKinsey and Company, and then continue with Eddie Kearney and then BCG. So this is BCG is something that's very interesting because BCG Boston Consulting Group was spin off from Arthur Delittle. So uh, because the, the the founder of BCG, Mr. Bruce Harrison was the consultant from Arthur D. Little. So BCG is like actually like a, a child of uh, uh, Arthur D. Little. And then afterward, there was spin-off from BGC to become a Ben and Company. So uh, it's like a Ben is like a, the grandchild of uh, Arthur D. Little. As the company that already over 130 years in the business, Arthur D. Little had a lot of experience uh, in advising the business around the world. Like for instance, is that in 1966, ADL has helped to setting up OPEC. By the way, just uh, for your information that I had a discussion today with the governor of OPEC uh, from period 2015, 2016, Bapak Dr. Widyawan Prawira Atmaja, and uh, actually he planned to join as well in this webinar. 
So, but uh, I don't know if you have a time, but uh, I had the discussion that he planned to, he's very interested with the topic that will be bring by uh, Arthur D. Little. And then afterward is that, uh, uh, like for instance, and you can see in the scene that in 2017, uh, there was a, a, an event, a uh, quite big event in the Middle East, that re uh, restructuring of oil and gas sector in uh, one of the Middle East countries. So uh, the one that's doing it is Mr. Trang Gino with us. And then in 2019, which is last year, uh, there was also uh, like uh, the big project about technology foresight and roadmap strategy for one of Southeast Asia oil and gas company. And this is uh, Trang doing it. So this is uh, just uh, like a, a brief overview, view. And then this is just for your information that Arthur D. Uh, currently uh, presents in uh, more than 14, 40 offices around the world. You can see the portfolio of the Arthur D. Little. Uh, saat ini di Jakarta kebetulan belum ada entitinya in Indonesia. Jadi uh, di Indonesia saat ini menginduk di Southeast Asia di Singapura ya. Jadi kebetulan kalau untuk Indonesia saat ini saya perwakilannya kebetulan. Dan if we talking about the uh, what we done in Southeast Asia, uh, so, uh, Arthur D. Little has served more than 100 client in Southeast Asia. So like uh, for instance in Indonesia, we already uh, contributed to uh, serve some company like Pertamina for instance, Indosat, Angkapa, Angkasa Pura, and also Garuda, and also another big company as well. And in Southeast Asia, you can find that the DBS, the Maxec Holdings, and then Petronas, uh, uh, Petros in Malaysia, in Thailand, in Philippines, there are uh, many big projects. So what we are doing, uh, what uh, Arthur Deliver, De 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 Deliver is uh, in relate with the strategy, economic and organization, and then technology innovation management and operation management. So this is a brief overview, a brief overview uh, about Arthur De Little, just uh, for your understanding. And then now I would like to introduce to uh, the speaker, Mr. Trangi, uh, as it was uh, introduced by MC that uh, Trang is now head of energy and utilities for Asia Pacific of Arthur De Little Southeast Asia. Trang has uh, more than 20 years experiences in the oil and gas industry. So uh, his area now call, including uh, Middle East and then Austral Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, and also uh, Indonesia, of course, including Indonesia, including the organizational restructuring and then uh, growth strategy, diversification strategy, technology, digital strategy, hydrocarbon maturation and operational excellence. Before joining with ADL, Trung worked with the Slumber C Business Consulting and then also with uh, Halliburton. So it's quite tremendous uh, experiences. Uh, education, Trung holds MBA from Mel Melbourne Business School and he also has a mechanical and space engineering degree at the University of Queensland, Australia. And then the second speaker, Mr. Stephen Rogers, uh, is uh, the partner of Global Energy and Utility Practice, a very high experience and uh, one of the uh, reference if uh, many people are talking about the technical thing in uh, oil and gas, like a, pro a PSC, for instance, uh, a PSC and then gross split, some, uh, something like this, uh, a very, very, very high experience. Uh, already in a business more than 40 years, uh, uh, 40 years, uh, including uh, including with uh, some of experiences in the, in the company. Uh, he ha he his consulting focus was uh, in the software surface, geotechnical strategy, due diligence, and many, many things in relate with the strategy. And he already served many big client around the world, including a quiet energy, Saudi Aramco, Zatco of source, and various clients at Syria, Italy, Argentina, Colombia, Kazakhstan, and uh, Georgiana, Albania. So he, uh, prior to Arthur D. Little, uh, Mr. Stephens uh, has about 25 year experiences in oil and gas exploration and development program, uh, 
offshore operation like uh, in BP has an TXU in North Sea and United States. Education, Mr. Seppen holds the Master of Art in Earth Sciences from Oxford University, a very famous university, and also MBA in INSEAD Paris. Again, it's very, uh, very famous university. Now, without further introduction, I would like to offer to Stephen and uh, Trung. Uh, Trung and Stephen, you have uh, 50 minutes to, 50 minutes combined to to uh, to do the presentation before uh, before afterward they will discuss uh, in a Q and A session. Please. Well, let me just share the screen if I can. Okay. Very good. Okay, there you go. Right, do you want to okay. maximize that? That's fantastic. Thank you, Trung. Yeah. Do you want to flick forward until we get to the the right uh, the right point? Great, very good. Thank you very much, everybody, and um, I uh, and thank you for the introductions. As uh, as was indicated, I'm a geologist by background, um, and I've had a good range of experience over the last forty years. But I have to say that this particular wave, this particular cycle in the oil and gas industry certainly feels different to many of the others that we've seen over the last 30 or 40 years. Now, yes, this is largely the result of COVID-19 and the collapse in demand that we've seen as a result of the economic impact that this pandemic has had on most of the world's economies at the same time. Now, if we look back to the recession that we saw 10 years ago, the um, what's labelled here the Great Recession of 2008-2009, while this had a about a 3% impact on, on GDP in the advanced economies, in global terms, it didn't have much impact overall on the world as a whole. That, of course, contrasts with the impact of the depression in the, in the early 30s in the U.S., where the impact year on year for three or four years was over, well, was averaged about 10%, which is catastrophic at the time. But nevertheless, the impact that we're seeing in the advanced economies during 2020 is estimated by the, uh, by the IMF to be 6% less so in the emerging economies, but a drop in, in economic output of 3% that we can see in the, in the world overall is still very, very dramatic. And as a result, it's seeing very dramatic impacts on the consumption of energy. Next slide, Trung, if you could, please. Um, on the le over on the left, you can see the IMF, IMF's um, prediction of a 6% overall drop in, uh, in global GDP for the year as a whole in 2020. And that's despite the fact that there's going to be uh, undoubtedly um, uh, the implementation of quantitative easing and many additional measures to mitigate the, the, the crisis. And I think here we should all give a vote of thanks to the economists around the world that have developed these tools, such as quantitative easing, to mitigate the very real uh, economic hardship that this is causing so many individuals and so many businesses around the world. This is not, of course, to offset the, the personal tragedies that COVID is causing to hundreds of thousands of people around the world that, are the, this, that provide the backdrop to this industry collapse. Um, and I think we should all give a private moment of, of reflection and um, uh, about this, uh, this personal tragedies that underlie these very stark figures. Nevertheless, what you can see over on the right-hand side are the trends in overall energy demand, highlighting that 6% anticipated energy collapse during 2020 the largest drop since the end of, two, of, of the Second World War in the 40s. And that assumes a relatively cautious opening up 
of the world economies towards the end of the year, a cautious um, uh, recovery from the lockdown that we've seen in so many economies over the last three or four months. Trung, if you could flick forward, thank you. Um, and that lockdown, of course, has been the result of the explosion of COVID-19 cases in so many geographies around the world at the same time. In the Americas, of course, that um, that that explosion, an almost uncontrolled explosion in North America and South America, that explosion in cases is still carrying on with very with very weak understanding and political control of the abilities to uh, to constrain it. In the in Asia and in Europe, of course, that pandemic has been brought more effectively under control. Um, and we'll have a look at those, the differences there in the next slide, Tron. Um, we can see, for example, that China, which is one of the, the earliest countries to, to suffer from the pandemic, that the number of cases was brought very early on into, into good control, as it was in South Korea, um, after a slightly later peak in Japan, um, Europe collectively um, at a much higher rate of penetration. The cases now have been brought under control, albeit uh, three or four months later. In the United States, not so much. Here, there's a steady rate of new cases of 30,000 a day of new COVID cases um, with very little sign of any social measures or, or other measures to, to bring it under control. And there's obviously some, some detail there on the right about what these cases are. In Southeast Asia, the impact has been much less severe. In Thailand, much more effectively brought under control. Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, perhaps a slightly worrying increase, but in overall terms, Southeast Asia much less affected than other parts of the world. Next slide, Strong. Um, but of course, if we look worldwide, um, and this is just looking at the European stock markets, if we look worldwide, then that drop in demand, the 6% drop in energy demand, has had a very severe impact on industry, manufacturing, if we look at automotive and manufacturing, a catastrophic drop between the 25th of April and the March the 20th um, in stock market values, in transport and uh, travel and transportation, similarly a, a steep collapse. Whereas perhaps healthcare, consumer goods, technology, telecoms, even utilities have seen much a much lower level of increase. Indeed, some of these colours, some of these industries highlighted in green here have actually seen increases. Some of, them have, some of these industries have responded to the economic impact of the COVID crisis by providing the, the services and the products that are necessary and have actually shown growth. Oil and gas, however, is the one that we are critically interested in, and it's the one sector that has shown a uh, the most impact, the most that has suffered the most, and it's the one that we really under, need to understand where it's going, what's happened to it. Next slide, please. Um, what is it that's that, that, that's caused this very strong impact in stock market values, and of course the strong reduction in free cash flows and earnings output that underpins that? Well, yes, it's the demand. We've seen the demand. In the, the reduction in demand in, in, the, in the first half of the year and the projected continuation of that, redu the, that, that demand reduction over the next three, six, nine months potentially. Indeed, most projections indicate that it's going to take years before re demand recovers to its 1999, sorry, its um, 2019 levels. And that even that is going to depend on the extent to which it is um, uh, able to displace the continuing encroachment from alternative uh, wind and solar um, renewable energies. 
But at the same time that that demand was reducing, of course, there was an encroaching and continuing oversupply. Yes, that's partly because production was continuing at the same level, but also partly because of a um, of a of a price war, a, uh, a supply war between Russia and Saudi Arabia that emerged at the same time. Um, and so we'll come on to look at that later. The result of all of this was a strong drop in crude prices, resulting in uh, low and in some, in some cases negative margins for some operations, both production and on the downstream refining side, with the result that many operations couldn't actually cover their costs. There's not enough crude storage to, come to, to store the crude that is being produced. And in particular, oil field services have been the first things, the first areas of the sector, the first areas of the business to be impacted. That's a very important issue. Trump, next, next slide, thank you. Um, and here's the, 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 the time sequence that you can observe from $70 a barrel, quite comfortable in January. And then the first signs, the first indications that the infection is starting to bite in February and then in March. Still, at oil prices of around $60 a barrel, but it's, <clears throat> it's not then until... The, the Russians declare war on the Saudis by pumping get oil into the market to claim market share at the wholesale level for crude, that the wheels really start to fall off the wagon An awareness of the sensitivity of the supply-demand balance to this growing COVID-19 demand change really starts to bite. And through the middle part of March, you can really start to see prices drop as demand changes, uh, the demand, su the supply demand balance changes such that prices drop 72% by the end of March, the early part of April. Yes, we've seen some recovery as demand has recovered, but only to the levels of up to about $35, $40 a barrel. Next. Next, uh, next slide, please. Um, and the, the only reason that that recovery has taken place is because of recovery and, and uh, holding back production by the OPEC and the OPEC plus countries who've got together um, to have a rolling tapered series of production cuts over the next year, um, 9.7 million a day over the next few months, reducing over the next couple of years, which will um, hopefully bring supply and demand back into balance. Next slide. Thank you, Trump. Um, and you can see the importance of that balance on this slide, where, yes, there's sometimes over the last three, four, five years, there's month to month, quarter to quarter been a slight excess and a slight uh, deficit in, in, in global supply, uh, maybe somewhere between um, up to one, one and a half million barrels uh, per day, depending on the time of year. And this is the normal amount that can be coped with through the standard level of storage that's present at refineries and in at the major transit points on the network. But when the wheels start to fall off, as they did at the beginning part of this year, the surplus in the system becomes at such a high level, five, six, 16 levels of um, 16 million barrels a day of excess capacity, that the story, the, the innate flexibility in the system can't cope, and if it's for that reason that the that the the prices were forced into a negative position, albeit briefly as a result of a, a, a technical change. So yes, there has been a a, a, a restoration back to normal. Uh, something a little bit more like normal levels of price and supply in the most recent quarter down here at the far right. 
But unless OPEC and the OPEC plus countries maintain their constraint, then it's very, it will be very easy for that to, to flip backwards to the situation that we saw in March again. Next. Thank you, Troy. The result of all of this uh, chaos in the market and the nervousness that many companies are feeling about the likely future outlook for 2021, 2022, is that EMP companies, the upstream companies, have absolutely slashed their, cap their capital expenditure program for the next couple of years to prepare for the worst case. Now, all sorts of companies have been doing this, um, and you can see the impact, whether it's for national oil companies, um, uh, who've had a, uh, who've made major reductions. Some of the the majors, the international oil companies, have also had similar levels of uh, of reduction. Um, the shale companies in North America have made massive changes, given their relatively small size. As have the independents, the Canadian companies. All have made, uh, on average, about a thirty percent reduction in capital spend, and it's likely that more change will happen. We haven't had any indication yet from some of the Middle Eastern companies. We haven't had any indication yet from some of the Russian companies. Almost certainly we will see a further capital spend reduction from them too. Um, next, uh, next slide. Thank you, Trump. Um, one of the bigger changes, in particular, um, one of the bigger changes that we have to reflect on today is the, uh, the, the how the sector will change after the crisis um, in terms of talent, in terms of manpower, and the, the digital training in particular. I don't want to dwell on this now. I think this is something that Trung will come back to. But if we reflect on the history of the industry, we're now at a, an inflection point where many of the people who came into the industry in the 60s and 70s and 80s um, are now effectively leaving the industry through return, retirement or for, for other reasons. And particularly given the layoffs that we're seeing this year globally, um, there's where has in the past there's been a lot of talent in the industry. We're now seeing a, a challenge as to who in the sector, and this isn't uniform, of course, it doesn't apply to every every jurisdiction, but who in the industry will be leading forward the new set of growth, the new range in the years to come, um, whatever the industry looks like when it has recovered. Next slide. Thank you. So what is that, what is that recovery and what will, those, what will companies look like after this perfect storm has passed? Well, the long-term trend, of course, is for the energy transition um, to continue. Many companies, most companies, of course, are undergoing this transition to a lower carbon, electricity-rich value chain position. And most, certainly most of the European majors, the international companies, are, are following this quite aggressively, quite continuously. And we're also seeing a portfolio shift to gas. In many companies, and we've noticed that not only in North America, but in many parts of the world. But we'll see in the shorter term, however, before we get to this, uh, this, this long-term position, we'll see extensive project cancellation. We'll see reduced re new reserves additions with reductions in exploration, um, reductions in organic uh, reserves growth. We'll see bankruptcies worldwide, certainly from many of the smaller, perhaps the larger companies, and restructuring, and quite active asset portfolio restructuring as companies sell a bit of this, buy a little bit of that to reshape themselves for the long term future that they observe. Next slide, thank you. Um, and how they get to this long term future will, of course, depend on on the, the nature of the oil price projection, the oil price progression that we see. Um, we might, of course, see quite a sharp bounce back, a V-shaped recovery to a nice high oil price again, um, with the 
IOC is refocusing on shareholder returns and many of the delayed projects restarting. Um, perhaps more likely is a stagnation to rather lower oil prices with a more of an L-shaped recovery. And in that example, uh, in that scenario, the industry will probably end up being a little bit smaller. There'll be a focus on lower costs. There's, there'll be strong transformation from the international by the international oil companies, with many of the uh, mothballed projects simply being cancelled. Um, <clears throat> if we look at, um, uh, at, at oversupply being uh, much longer term, then of course damage to the sector will be much more severe, much more severe chain um, shutdowns of high cost of production, dram more dramatic levels of ENP, uh, ENP capex. And even if, if there's more of a bounce back to slightly higher levels of, of, um, of, of oil price, we'll still see many major projects shut down and a much, a much quicker transition of many of the international companies to an energy transition, a, an energy renewable, uh, renewable energy uh, perspective. Next, um, next uh, slide, thank you. So yeah, this is just a, a restating of, of that uh, original position. Yes, all companies are gonna have to get smarter, by which I mean reducing costs through interact, introduction of digitalization, AI, machine learning, and automatic automatized processes. Yes, they'll become gassier. Yes, they'll become uh, they'll they'll need to introduce more renewables in their in their portfolio, as well as reducing emissions, and as well as um, uh, having less CO two in their products and in their output. But they'll have also they'll have to have a shorter reserves life. Um, they'll have to have a more agile response. They'll have to develop lower cost positions and they'll have to realign their portfolios to give more rapid return of, of cash to their owners, whether they be, they be national governments or to shareholders. Next, next slide. Please. And this is simply the uh, a summary of that. I think we can skip over this, this slide. Just so we can get to... Um, get to the, uh, the end of that section um, before introducing Trung to talk about the particular implications for Indonesia. Thanks, David. Um, so let me go through this next uh, chapter where we talk about the implications for Indonesia. Um, I, I have, we have here uh, five implications that I'd like to, to uh, share with you. Um, each of them will take us into different parts of the oil and gas sector or the energy sector. Um, the first is about managing disruption um, through uh, from the oil and gas volatility. Uh, next is about how to uh, improve attractiveness for um, foreign investments into the sector. Uh, human capital that we heard a lot about and uh, have spoken um, uh, earlier on. Uh, sustainability, uh, revisiting the renewable uh, energy space. And last but not least is uh, the digital pilots and uh, how do we scale that up. So I take through to number one. Um, we've seen in the past, even the last two weeks, uh, oil price uh, anticipation forecasting. Um, a number of analysts have uh, shared with us their views. Um, and it's quite wide, uh, depending on uh, the various scenarios that uh, uh, that they use. Um, here, you'll see that we don't have a crystal ball, and it's quite unpredictable at uh, times, um, depending on the, the external and internal implications. So for us, uh, we've been trying to uh, uh, consult uh, our clients to really now to rethink their um, the strategy, the visions, to understand what does it look, not just at the five-year, seven-year time frame, but the 10, 15-year longer horizon. Obviously, the further out we go, um, the uh, more uncertainty that would look like. Uh, nevertheless, it's, it's still the first step to, to, to think about. Uh, scenario planning is quite important uh, for some of our uh, clients in the Middle East. We're looking at a 50-year time horizon, a 
explore their scenarios, uh, whether it be in mobility, in healthcare. Um, we're trying to map out what could be the possibility. Um, same thing for oil and gas or the energy sector. We, we should be doing the same thing. Last but not least is once you have that, what would the playbook look like um, for different scenarios? And um, taking that step further is how could we use uh, digital and AI uh, for us to anticipate uh, the external news that uh, may come into play? Um, looking at uh, uh, the playbook, we've, um, we've tried to map out um, what that may uh, uh, look like for you um, in the link gas sector, uh, depending on the various uh, um, external factors, uh, the impact, the decision points, and key strategic uh, actions. Um, if we uh, look through, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the scenario points, um, we should be able to quickly understand what are the decision areas uh, to take, whether it be in the human factors or the supply chain or the asset management. Um, all that will have key actions for us to take as our playbook. Just an example of uh, something we've done in the past uh, for a major uh, uh, OFS player. Uh, we looked at how to um, anticipate, and not here to, to, to forecast the price, but anticipate an upward or downward trend using a number of leading key indicators. This is something that uh, your firms or your, your, your organization should be able to uh, um, uh, do. And then through that, understand how they uh, interact with the, the sector. Uh, monitor that uh, as we go along for the short, medium, and long term, as far as you can. Obviously, with the longer the term it is, um, the the, the um, uncertainty will be higher. And from there, uh, uh, we're able to develop uh, through these various scenarios certain key actions and decision points uh, for the management team. This is here what I meant by uh, managing and understanding the volatility of our sector. It can be done even though we've had uh, a lot of uh, different um, analyst uh, viewpoints on where the oil price may, may be. But what you really need to think about is um, what is the trends as you go into the three, six, nine, twelve months time frame. If we look at uh, foreign investments to attract uh, into the EMP space for Indonesia, um, it is quite uh, important for us to think about this. How do we uh, see uh, our energy consumption um, versus our production? Um, here on this map on the left-hand side, uh, you can see that consumption will uh, is already and uh, will continue to um, outpace uh, the production um, uh, that we have in in, in country. Um, this, if you look on the right hand side on the investments, um, it has dropped uh, since uh, the last crisis, and uh, we're now trying to uh, to understand, you know, where we're heading towards uh, to ensure that we do um, produce a lot more for what we have. Uh, there is, uh, if we plot out uh, the, the number of years going forward uh, from to date uh, in 2020 um, and the next uh, uh, decade or so, there will be some sort of uh, shortfall both in oil and gas uh, based on the 2030 targets. Uh, what would that mean for um, our sector and how as uh, the oil, oil ecosystem uh, from regulatories to uh, national oil companies to uh, our, our um, service providers. How does that affect us and what do we need to do to ensure that this gap can be minimized um, and therefore the uh, security of um, the oil and gas production for Indonesia? Uh, we'll need to obviously understand um, the, the uh, introduction of the growth split has been now a few years. Um, it was there to reinvigorate the participation, promote uh, efficiency, more or less trying to bring in um, skin to the game. Um, we've compared to many other uh, uh, product sharing or even service contracts in the past, and uh, not uh, one will fit uh, everyone. And so um, what you have done to introduce a growth split is, is quite nice and fair. Uh, but now it's time to see whether uh, are there are any further challenges, ambiguities, and how do we manage that um, these are the key questions that I propose um, that we, uh, you know, we understand a bit more is how could uh, there be more transparencies uh, for regulatory regimes, businesses, uh, for the contractors? Um, are we able to try and leverage more of the national oil companies to reinvigorate the development of oil and gas sector? 
um, the best practices around uh, the world, uh, what do they look like and how do we uh, uh, try to uh, adopt some of these things to Indonesia. Um, as Flo has mentioned earlier on, um, a couple of years ago, we looked at a restructuring uh, for one of the uh, Middle East nations um, for uh, the oil and gas sector. And here we looked at uh, what does the regulatory uh, look like, uh, what's their responsibilities versus what should the national oil company be. Uh, we then looked at uh, the, the, the holding company itself and whether uh, there needs to be some sort of restructure, uh, the fiscal regimes also uh, in terms of how, how could we attract more uh, players to come in. So there was a normal uh, number of different things that uh, we had looked at. Um, it's in the stages of uh, implementation. Uh, Indonesia has been um, producing oil and gas for a number of uh, 50, 60, uh, even more than that uh, uh, years. Uh, and so um, it's, it's probably uh, a good time to, to, to think about how uh, the PSC and the GABSC um, is faring to date. Developing human capital. Um, we, we see that quite a lot, not just in Indonesia, but across uh, the, 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 the um, uh, other parts of the world. Here we just focus on Indonesia itself. Um, the last five years, in 2015, um, we see uh, um, you know, the, the IOCs, the, the, the Indonesian EMPs, and various other small players from the Japanese, the Chinese coming through. Um, in 10 years, in, in another five years' time, in 2025, we see a change in um, the landscape. Um, less of the IOCs um, uh, will be participating um, uh, based on the current data, uh, more um, through to the Indonesian players, um, which then forces us to think, how do we then anticipate if we already have one, a gap in our oil and gas production, two, um, more um, um, focus on um, in um, Indonesian EMP players to, to, to fill these gaps. And the third is, you know, if we can, um, if we cannot uh, in the short term, how do we attract, um, you know, talent or, or, or foreign investments to, to help us with this? Um, if we compare uh, that uh, in the oil and gas sector globally, um, from 2010 to 2015 to last year, um, the interest or, or the um, um, the number of uh, young um, um, people that want to join the oil and gas is less and less appealing. Um, we're seeing a lot more uh, retirees, and uh, within the middle uh, here, um, uh, less experience uh, are coming through. Um, this here is not just for Indonesia, but it's more global. Um, if we look at the ranking of uh, the oil and gas sector uh, has declined as a, an attractiveness uh, for um, uh, graduates to come through. So then what does that really mean for, for us, not just in Indonesia, but as a global sense? <clears throat> I propose um, that you know, we may need to think about new and innovative ways to adopt uh, and build capabilities. Yes, we can go through the whole traditional ways of um, recruiting from best schools and so forth. Um, but is, is, is that, uh, you know, the only way? Um, here I propose that uh, we can look at what other uh, younger generations um, of this world are looking at. And if you look at a lot of statistics, we're seeing a lot of startups, entrepreneurs. Um, so we need to almost think about how do we include these next generation of leaders into our sector? Um, focus on the innovation technologies and digital space to enable efficiencies. There's now, um, you know, potentially a look at uh, shifting from uh, uh, marketing or, or recruiting as big oil to big energy as we uh, think about the, the trends, the mega trends um, from hydrocarbons to renewables. And as we heard Stephen mentioned about the acceleration of uh, energy transition, would this be uh, an attractive uh, offer for our um, next generation? Opportunities for um, the, the leaders of the future. Diversification targets uh, will probably need to be set uh, a lot higher uh, to ensure that we try to include uh, other uh, um, uh, race, genders, um, types of different um, skill sets into our current talent pool. At the moment, if you look at the oil and gas sector, we're probably looking around about 8 to 
the sense is that of females, how can we do more uh, to attract diversification here? I uh, mentioned before about scholarship and partnerships, but here let's just think about how do we go beyond that uh, to attract the strong candidates, not through uh, the, the usual channels, but uh, some of the um, companies are now looking further um, you know, into the high school um, education. Um, not just for regionally, but globally as well. We've done a lot of uh, work along this, sect, uh, this space um, in terms of uh, uh, management um, uh, of oil and gas futures later, um, looking at a curriculum for um, oil and gas uh, companies, uh, ministries. The... Um, oh, sorry, I mentioned the fifth one already. So... So in that development uh, side of things, there's, there's a gap uh, that we need to address. And um, I'd like to propose that as uh, the regulator or the ecosystem within this webinar, um, how do we see ourselves attracting different types of talents and seeing how the next generations of, of um, employees uh, may be attracted to oil and gas. Uh, the fourth part is a scallop of digital pilots. Um, we've heard a lot about digitization uh, um, across a number of um, companies um, in the last downturn, and it's been accelerated uh, over the last few years. Here are the key um, uh, stepping stone, uh, I would say, to adopt, and we've seen these uh, through our clients and also other, other uh, peers of um, um, in, in your space. Uh, the strategy part, um, it's, it's the very first that we uh, have um, looked into identifying the business problems. Not all digital uh, can be used in um, um, the, the space you're in. So we need to think about the various business problems, the assets, what they uh, require uh, to then quickly move into the pilot stage uh, where we then try to uh, go beyond the proof of concepts and institutionalize that uh, within our firm. And last but not least, and if possible, uh, to commercialize it, whether it be internally or externally. Uh, a lot of companies have succeeded in doing so. Um, some are going through their transformation, but it still takes quite a lot of effort. And if we don't go through the um, uh, uh, the steps uh, that I've mentioned over time, um, we may see um, the transformation fail. A lot of uh, opportunities across the value chain in utilizing digital uh, as an enabler. Um, here are just some of the examples uh, through from exploration, development, production. And as you've already seen in probably in your own organizations uh, where they apply, some have gone through further in terms of um, applying um, AI, machine learning into their operations, into the corporations as well. <clears throat> the benefits of uh, the, the digital pilot to scale up uh, through the different phases um, ranges depending on um, where we apply and how much we apply. Um, here, the biggest part uh, is through the development production side of things, whereby we'll see quite a large um, improvement in efficiency. Uh, the technology enablers, um, as we have seen um, already in some parts of the um, uh, of operations through cloud-based edge computing, um, high-power computing. Uh, we're now looking at the uh, next generation of um, AI machine learning and obviously Internet of Things connecting workforce, uh, remote, and so forth. Um, how does this really fit into uh, your organization's ecosystem? It's something that I'd like to take back on the strategy of the firm, uh, the, the support from regulatories and the inclusion of um, the startups innovation hubs that uh, is popping up uh, throughout the world and hope we can create something in Indonesia as well to foster uh, the next generation to, to participate in the oil and gas sector. As Flo had mentioned earlier on, uh, we had done something recently for an, a Southeast Asian national oil company to look at their digital and technology strategy, uh, foresighting on what is coming up in the next five, ten years. And uh, we're also looking at um, the convergence of other technologies used in uh, sectors like healthcare, um, automotive, telco, uh, to bring into the oil and gas space. As, a uh, as an example of preparing for the digitized environment, um, 
uh, our team has looked into uh, for an IOC, um, how would pure telecommunications uh, can be set up to enable this digital um, enablement. Throughout uh, the, the work we've done, um, we've identified a number of traps um, through implementing digital. Uh, we looked at the uh, situation analysis, the experimentation, the scale out and impact. And through that, there are uh, these five key traps. Of course, there are more. Um, here we look at where people tend to fail in is the over analysis, uh, running too many experiments, um, um, we, we, we tend to overcomplicate um, some of the um, implementation, the scale outs, and we try to uh, pull out of uh, the value of guess quite quickly um, uh, to the implementation stage um, by looking at um, uh, less of the digital space, but more on the human factor or the mindset. Um, then last but not least, one of the um, guess traps here are the metrics understanding which metrics to use uh, so that we could anticipate uh, what we could change and implement um, going forward. Some metrics uh, may be uh, too, too, too late to, to uh, correct the course. And so understanding what KPIs um, or, or even uh, key risk indicators is important. Um, this slide I won't go through too much, but um, it and ensures us to be uh, successful, there are in each of these situations uh, some enablers to look at. Um, here, uh, if we look at thinking outside of our own industry, some things that uh, perhaps, you know, even for myself as a veteran of oil and gas for the last 20 years, we need to now think what could outside uh, bring in, uh, go beyond the traditional space, uh, look at the show me, not tell me, uh, perhaps not so much as a big bang. Looking at um, uh, uh, moving away from the prototypes to the minimal um, viable product, uh, we don't need to analyze to death uh, the, the type of uh, digital technology we need, but we need to keep on moving to, to be on the proof of concepts. And then through the uh, continuous measurement uh, benefits, uh, we'll need to look at how do we adapt this in not just technology, but the behavioral change um, and the change management we have to put through for the organization that we're implementing. If I can then take a few more minutes to uh, share with you the, the last point of the implications for Indonesia, the energy sector is about sustainability and re renewable energy. Globally, uh, we look at the energy weighting um, at the S&P 500. Over the, the last decade or so, it has dropped uh, by about 8% from 11 to 5. Um, this indicates that uh, a lot of the investors are trying to look away from the oil and gas or traditional oil and gas spent, um, the, the hydrocarbon spent, um, more into more sustainable um, future. And so is, is there a fear of investors moving away from what we do? And so as uh, regulators and uh, on gas uh, ecosystem, uh, we need to rethink of um, uh, renewable energy or the new energy and the energy transition. Here, um, uh, we look at the IRR for a typical uh, energy project. And if we look at if uh, the pre-oil price um, uh, um, crisis at 2019 at a $6 per barrel. Yes, uh, at the pre-FID, we are quite attractive, IRR of 22%. To date, if we look at uh, $35 per barrel, um, the return investment is about 7%, which is more or less on par with um, some of the renewable projects, if not worse off. So there's a dilemma for us to think about, you know, um, whether to uh, decide to accelerate our renewables or energy transition, um, or do we hold back? Here, um, we've heard a lot of, even from last night with Irina, uh, discussing how uh, renewable energy will be accelerated, even as ADL, we believe that the acceleration will occur, um, and the governments will be supporting this as uh, we move towards cleaner fuel. If we look at Indonesia, our target uh, for uh, for the various stages and at um, 2050, um, and if we look at the solar and the types of different types of projects from uh, hydro, geothermal, on onshore wind, uh, by 2050, we will see some gaps. Um, what are the, the, the dilemmas or, or the trilemmas that we're seeing? 
and and what we need to to, to do to ensure that uh, renewable or sustainability of uh, uh, clean energy is is um, uh, achieved in Asia is to understand how tariffs, electricity, uh, utilize, um, utility um, tariffs, uh, energy subsidies, uh, sub- subsidies, and um, uh, whether our renewable targets is is uh, realistic for us to to meet. Um, one other thing to, to think about uh, when we look at this, uh, the renewable space and, and sustainability is about social returns. Um, a lot of studies have taken place in various organizations to understand uh, what does it mean for for us if we go into um, a, a country or into a different sector, what are the returns we get uh, for social uh, impact? Here, um, I wanted to just mention that We've done a lot of work here in regards to uh, the analysis, and even from last night's uh, debate uh, with uh, from Irina, they were talking about if going into renewables, we'll be seeing about 30 to 50 percent increase in different types of um, um, jobs. Um, in Australia, we're looking at um, renewable um, uh, targets uh, quite heavily and and uh, putting in a lot of stimulus from the government um, to support. Um, opportunities, uh, reskilling uh, capabilities, um, and moving towards uh, um, uh, growing the economy through the renewable space. So uh, social returns on investment analysis is quite important for us to understand what is the impact of going towards this uh, renewable space, uh, what would it be the uh, types of initiatives you need to take in place to train and upskill um, um, um your people in terms of uh, job opportunities. <clears throat> so that uh, um, really concludes the uh, five implications uh, for the Indonesian oil and gas sector. Uh, let me just summarize quickly here is that uh, first, uh, we talk about managing disruptions. So we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be seeing another uh, disruption coming through. Um, Improving the attractiveness to support uh, the, the production gap that we have in the future, uh, fulfilling the uh, the, um, the human capital um, um, gap for the future leaders of the oil and gas sector, scaling up the uh, digital space for efficiencies um, and productivity, and last but not least, to rethink uh, whether we could in- accelerate like many other nations, going into the sustainability and, and uh, the new energy transition space. Let me just hand you back to Stephen to uh, uh, close the the, uh, the discussion, and uh, we can open up the Q&A after that. Very good. Thank you, Trung. <clears throat> um, I, I thought it would be useful, just that I noticed that we just have, uh, I think, one or two minutes left on the clock. I thought it would be useful... Um, to reflect on some of the issues that relate to, by way of closing the debate, closing the the presentation, to reflect on issues that relate to the interface between the Indonesian nation and international investment. Obviously, the changes of the last six months have represented a profound shock in terms of price, allocation of capital by the international industry and their intention and desire to invest, not in Indonesia particularly, but in any international um, upstream domain. And I was asked by a uh, by a lawyer friend of mine quite recently, well, what does this mean in terms of where people are going to start to fall out Where are the disputes going to happen? And what can countries do to make sure that they continue to attract capital so that they're, as they need it, to make sure that they are able to foster and develop their industries? Because clearly, if there's a shortage of investor capital, as Trong just illustrated, there increasingly is in the oil industry globally, then some countries perhaps those that need that capital the most for their development, then some countries are going to be better placed to attract that capital than others. 
Now, there are going to be challenges in that, um, certainly at the exploration stage. Um, there are going to be some companies perhaps who try to back out of work program obligations because of staffing issues, poor economics, poor perspectives of future cash flows. And the question for those, for the governments involved, therefore, is how to ensure that exploration activities are not delayed. I mean, apart from just enforcement, um, there, are, there is, in fact, an array of different um, negotiations, uh, revisitations that could take place of non-profit related upfront taxes, things like land taxes, signature bonuses, field development plan, approval bonuses, um, uh, and, and bonuses, upfront monies of that sort, which can, uh, the removal of which or the postponement of which can encourage companies who are perhaps at the margin um, thinking, wondering whether or not exploration in a particular domain on a particular block might be wise or not. Then again, there might also be challenges and disputes, debates at either the de field development or field production stage. Companies may be wondering whether they should mothball a development halfway through, and in extremists, they might wonder whether it's actually worthwhile shutting in production, um, and they may demand a whole series of changes in fiscal terms, or maybe even just non-tax related uh, incentives to continue with plans that in higher oil price circumstances they would have continued with. And the governments have to be able to identify what commercial policies, what legal strategies even are necessary to ensure that fields can keep producing, that developments can, main, can be maintained underway in the short term in response to these very often very real challenges from the government's concern, sorry, from the companies concerned. Now, often those debates internally within the government and between the government and the companies involved are going to relate to the, um, the competition between countries in terms of the, uh, the terms on their production sharing contracts that they offer foreign oil companies. So it's very important at times of inflection point in prices that governments understand where they rank country to country in terms of their ability, and then they can calibrate where they stand in terms of their ability to attract capital. Um, are they one of the less attractive countries on a risked basis, or one of the more attractive countries on a risk basis. And there are quite subtle things that, come, that, 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 that the ministries can do to attract acre to attract companies uh, into their in, into investing in the country, um, at, even just at the margin, on the licensing round stage, perhaps, rather than retaining, which we have seen in a couple of instances in Africa, rather than retaining all of the low-risk acreage for the national oil company, perhaps parceling some of that out to international investors to act as a sweetener to investment in other activities in the country. So there are a whole series of perspectives here, but I think it's important to bear in mind it's not just about the broad-scale issues there are some smaller scale issues related to the management of individual pieces of acreage that uh, are, are related to the, uh, the, 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 in, the international abilities to attract capital on, um, on, on the oil and gas assets involved. And with that, thank you very much. Um, it's been a great privilege uh, speaking with all of you today. And I think now we're... No, I, think, I believe we're open for questions. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Stephen and uh, Trung, for a very good explanation. So uh, there are many, many questions, actually, uh, but uh, some of 
questions uh, is uh, actually a, a bit the same. So I combine some of the questions. So the first question is that uh, this is like the summary of uh, a, a more than more than two question. So uh, how are other oil and gas uh, regulators preparing for post recovery? Yeah, that's the first question. And second is that both our national oil company and other local players should doing to manage this volatility. So this is the, the first two question that maybe you can answer. So the did, first, did you want to go for it? Yeah. yeah, the first question then is what are the regulators doing to manage that volatility? Um, I think at a... The national, most national levels, there's very little they can do. I think there's, um, they're, they're battening down the hatches for what is certainly going to, in the Middle East, for example, there is undoubtedly going to be challenges in terms of meeting national budgets. Um, in Russia, we're seeing the same. Uh, and the challenges there among all the national bodies has been um, to what extent do they dip into sovereign wealth funds? How do they control their expenditure, uh, their social expenditures? Um, but else, or the only other levers that companies have to pull are those which relate, to, as I was talking on the last slide, those which relate to keeping the show on the road, keeping the investment going, attracting investment, making sure that too much, that not too much delay occurs in development, and persuading companies that all will be right, that that the they should continue with their investment program, they shouldn't shouldn't shut in production, so that main so that uh, revenues can continue to to flow into the treasury all right strong yeah sorry i just want to add here also um uh, different um regulators around the world will have its own different views obviously now um with the 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 covid and the lockdowns um the uh situation we're in is slightly different to what we're used to in the past and so uh, Stephen rightly said that it, it's not that much more we can do as an oil and gas sector, but there are uh, government initiatives uh, uh, that are, like I mentioned before, accelerating a lot of the uh, new energy um, uh, space, the, the topic on this, the, the topic on digitalization, the topic on new technology innovation. This will all help um, stimulate the growth of the economy um, and also to reach their objectives of um providing new skilled workers, uh, employment opportunities, as well as um, upskilling the, uh, the nation for the future. Um, so this is, in a sense, the, the government or regulatory side of things. Uh, in terms of the uh, oil and gas players in the sector, uh, we have seen how disruption of supply chain, um, you know, impacted us, not just us, but also the other sectors uh, due to the COVID and the lockdowns. So in, in, um, in, in that mind, uh, how do we as a sector um, and, and, and the people in this webinar um, manage to uh, provide uh, local supply um, so that we can anticipate, uh, so we can prevent the next uh, disruption? Uh, doesn't mean that we'll localize everything. It just means that we may need to um, set up uh, key uh, supply chains within Indonesia or maybe perhaps within the region if there's a bubble or a hub. Um, that way, we don't need to rely too much on, uh, say, the likes of China or, or, or wherever else we're, we're getting supplies from in the next, say, pandemic. Um, so people are now talking about how do we uh, localize our supply chain? Um, so, so that would be um, something I, I, I'd mention to the uh, audience. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, just this, just information to to all the audiences that uh, uh, the uh, the question and uh, the question uh, Q and A session uh, sh uh, will be 
done until five o'clock. So I will choose some of the question that maybe uh, considering to the time frame. So I will choose a just just selected question. But uh, I promise that uh, you can send an email to us, and then we can uh, we can send uh, give an answer through email. So the first que- the, another question is that uh, this is from Mr. Hari Lumbantobing from Kemenaker, uh, so the Ministry of uh, Labor in Indonesia. So uh, what do you think, to Mr. Stephen Rogers, what do you think about the opportunity for biodiesel as substantive fuel to become main fuel in Indonesia? What do you think, Boris? Well, biodiesel is... Um, <laughs> It's something that we've looked at several times in Europe um, using uh, lumber, using forests as a as a feedstock. Um, this is Northern European larch, um, um, Scandinavian larch as a, as a feedstock, and it's something which does have positive economics. It has yep. positive economics, though, at $60 a barrel or north. Once you get down to $40 or $50 a barrel, in our experience, um, it wouldn't seem to be as viable. And we saw a number of projects that were being enthusiastically pursued um, during... 2013, 2014, right across North America, right across um, Northern Europe, um, Northern and Central Europe, which came to a screeching halt in 2015 and 2016, simply because the price had dropped so steeply. Now, technology develops, technology matures, and perhaps that price threshold may drop slightly. Um, I wouldn't say that it's um, it's something that um, would be top of the list for re- for displacing renewable technologies. However, and by renewable I mean solar and wind technologies at the moment at current prices. All right. Okay, so uh, another question is from uh, Bapak Fauzi Hernanto. So he's questioning uh, to both of you, why ADL predict that the oil price will take years to recover to the price of 2019? Is it because current oversupply trend in the market? Or there is another, another, another reason? <laughs> well, if I could predict the oil price... Um, with any reliability, I um, well, I wouldn't be here, and um, I would <laughs> I would only have done so by accident. However, there is some logic behind our collective view, and I'm sure Trong will will correct me or will will interrupt. Um, why do we think prices will stay low? I think ultimately it's because of our belief, perhaps as a as a technology consulting company, that the trends for technological advancement in renewable uh, renewable energies have now got to a, a sufficiently advanced point, a tipping point, if you like, that the impact, not on supply and the cost of supply, but on demand, is progressively steeper and steeper. In other words, peak demand may already be with us yeah. either this year or next year or the year after. And once you get to a con- progressively and continuously dropping demand, there's not a lot you can achieve in terms of um, managing and manipulating your supply um, to, 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 to increase your, your price except by dropping your supply still further and hence shrinking the sector. But that's just my, that's just our, our collective view or the view of a number of us. I don't know, Trung, if you want to expand on that. 
Yeah, also I want to mention that, um, uh, although I mentioned before that it's not going to be easy to predict, and a lot of analysts have mentioned uh, a number of different uh, oil prices for the next few years. Uh, but for us, um, if you think about is there going to be another second wave or third wave? Are we going to a, a longer uh, recovery? Um, this will have a huge impact on the demand and supply. Um, as we have seen so far, you know, as, as soon as we get into a lockdown, um, you know, we, we will get into the situation of whereby um, the demand is going to be reduced. If we're not careful and if we don't find the, the, the vaccine, um, flying will be quite uh, um, um, significantly impacted and I don't think we'll be at the rate we were back then. Um, roads on the cars uh, would be okay, fine. Uh, however, um, it, it's still not going to be back to the same as we were pre-COVID. Uh, so I think still the demand and supply is um, for us uh, perhaps um, still going to, to recover a little bit slower than perhaps some other analysts. And we will predict the fact that it'll be around about the $45 or $40 per barrel mark in the next year or so. Um, interestingly enough, um, once we hit that hump um, by 2022, perhaps, uh, we might see a spike um, uh, going beyond what we're used to in the pre-COVID situation because um, things may have gone back to, to, to normal and uh, beyond. So... Uh, unless we see a better recovery uh, in the global pandemic, unless we see uh, probably, um, you know, how to live with COVID, unless we see vaccines, um, the recovery may be a little bit slower than, than um, we, we, we hope it should be, and uh, therefore demand and supply will be impacted. And this is the dilemma for us, um, that if the oil price remains the same as this, the return on investments for a typical project for oil and gas, um, you know, there's a trade-off in, in our renewable space. And so if we continue on this path, does it mean the governments and, and other regulators, uh, oil and gas companies will transition to uh, accelerating uh, renewables if that's the case? Um, what does that mean for uh, the demand supply of oil and therefore the uh, uh, trajectory for um, along the recovery for the oil price. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tron. So uh, there is still, uh, we still have a time to discuss. There is still uh, some of other question. So uh, first is that, uh, next is uh, from uh, Pak Kolik Triananta. So actually there is a several question, but maybe I will take uh, some of points okay. already. In, but it's the first question is that uh, with current IOG's company leaving Indonesia, how quick do you think that Indonesia government can attract them to reinvest? So, with I mean, so maybe do you do you think that uh, what is uh, the 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 most uh, necessary things to do to attract uh, some of the international oil and gas company to back to Indonesia? <laughs> I think ultimately that question comes down to terms, uh, the commercial terms that companies are being offered. Um, and it's possible, I, I've not looked at the recently at the, uh, at the terms that, uh, that are being proposed. I've not done a comparison with other international, um, uh, with West Africa, for example, or Guyana or some of the other existing hot areas in exploration and production. It's possible that current terms in Indonesia have fallen below the global benchmark required to attract investment at a time when the, uh, the tide is going out, so to speak, in investment terms. Maybe that needs to be recalibrated, maybe it needs to be adjusted. And of course, as I mentioned on my last slide, it's not just a question necessarily of adjusting the raw terms. Sometimes companies respond to not just um, basic returns, but volume opportunity. Perhaps there are some um, perhaps low risk, but perhaps some, some high volume opportunities that, um, that they might respond to. Uh, and um, and that's often something that, uh, as in Iraq, for example, companies were accepting very poor terms in exchange for getting access to high volume 
uh, high volume opportunities, high volume fields. So there's an, a variety of different levers that could be pulled, I think. It's a question of looking at it um, in the round and comparing uh, for Indonesia and comparing that with the um, with the international benchmarks. Uh, so if I can also just add there that um, with um, you know the PSC terms, uh, gross splits, uh, as Stephen had mentioned, we, we haven't done a full study on this, but uh, there's a lot of articles and papers. Uh, you know, people are studying this a number of years now since it was introduced back in 1718. Um, I think it just needs also a bit of time for for this um, to um, to eventuate. But if you think about where we are today, um, not just here in Asia, but everywhere, everywhere else around the world, we're seeing a streamlining of portfolio. People, uh, um, like Stephen had mentioned, you know, uh, are um, rationalizing their assets. And so um, we might need to look at a bit broader than just uh, the, the PSCs, uh, but also think about uh, the company situation um, and how could they survive in today's environment with the oil price the way it is, um, the COVID situation, and you'll see a trend of people leaving um, various um, um, uh, assets, countries, to um, reprioritize what they see as their vision or their strategy going forward. Um, for Indonesia itself, um, this could be a double whammy here, whereby people have already started to look at leaving or is leaving, as well as some of the uh, terms that uh, you know need to be rethought re through. Um, a large thing that we did when we did the restructure uh, for one of the Middle East nations was about transparency. Um, and that was um, a big thing that we tried to understand uh, how to be more transparent to the contractors uh, that want to come in. Uh, that was uh, the biggest challenge for us to um, convince the regulators to, um, to, to allow. If you look at uh, some of the best countries uh, like Norway, they have it all um, in their website to understand what the terms and conditions are and how they will, you know, uh, come into the country, develop the, the oil and gas and, and exit, so forth. So um, all that it needs to be uh, thought through, as well as the conditions we're currently in, given the um, current crisis. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Tron. Thank you, Stephen. So we still have maybe about two questions, one more question. So this is... Uh, a question from uh, Joko Purwanto. Joko Purwanto, I think it's my friend, Joko Purwanto. <laughs> so to Mr. Rogers. <laughs> so to Mr. Roger, what is the logic behind your expectation that the future of oil industry could, will be cleaner after this crisis? I see that government will relax their climate change and environment requirement to help the industry cut their capex and to recover. In other sector than our industry, if one we see that industry are built out without any green string attached. Thank you. So, so the question is, will the response to COVID be for governments to relax their pressure mm. to green the industry mm. and encourage them to just invest in oil and gas and let loose the, the carbon constraints? Well, that's a possibility. Um, and it's certainly true that politicians are fickle and in many cases morally irresponsible. I'm not taking a position here. Um, I'm just suggesting that some cases what politicians believe in profoundly is changed overnight because of a different set of circumstances. And that is as it should be. After all, they're here, um, politicians are there to, to defend and protect the national interest at all times. I think, however, that in the minds of much, I mean, this is a personal opinion as much as anything else, but I think that the progressive shift in public opinion in the developed world, and I'm only saying about the developed world, is such that people no longer make the connection between economic growth, economic development, and the prosperity of the oil and gas industries. In, in a sense, they see, and investors see, 
the two being completely decoupled. Trung showed a very nice slide which showed that oil and gas was progressively becoming irrelevant in the stock markets because oil and gas itself is becoming irrelevant in the develop in the economies mm. of the <clears throat> developed markets. Growth, whether that's from new energy forms, um, expansion of, of wind and solar, the expansion of energy management systems and batteries and electric cars, growth in those markets is seen as being connected with industry sectors that have nothing to do with oil and gas. And for that reason, my suspicion is that it's... Um, that we won't see big pressure to restart the oil and gas investment in many parts of the world. Now, in some industries, uh, in some um, parts of the emerging world, of course, um, that will be completely different. And I'm, I, I don't have confidence that we, in China, for example, that we'll see any early curtailment of coal-fired generation. And the same may apply um, to diesel-fired generation in, um, in other markets as well. So I think we will see something of a divergence. But in the developed, uh, in, in, in the G20 economies, my suspicion is um, that we will see a, a continued rapid change towards um, a, uh, a renewable economy, uh, and we see that reflected in the strategies of BP and Shell and Repsol, Total, who were all making rapid moves in that direction. Interestingly, of course, Exxon Mobil, Oxy, a lot of the other big US players making no moves in that direction at all. Um, so that's an argument that I have to play out on the stock market floor. Um, Chug, do you have any any other thoughts? Uh, no, not much more than that. But the thing is, um, regulators, uh, if you look at the trends, um, even what I mentioned about scenario planning going for the future, um, th there is a sign that uh, they are pushing forward to this because it will stimulate the economy. And, uh, you know, the oil and gas sector is, is now um, well endowed with um, you know, existing players that can, um, you know, bring about the economy by itself. But uh, if we're looking at agreements across nations, um, Paris requirements and all that, um, the target that's going to be there, how aggressive will they push, uh, depends on each nation. But uh, uh, we feel, feel that um, this gives us a situation now to... Um, uh, reskill ourselves, uh, uh, invigorate the, the national uh, interest in renewables. Um, not to say that oil and gas will go away; uh, we'll still need it. Um, but I think that uh, this is the, the the chance for us now to think harder on uh, government initiatives and which they are coming through. Um, now, maybe in some uh, nations that are um, not quite yet uh, there in terms of uh, development of uh, technologies. Um, but uh, as solar, it's getting cheaper and cheaper to develop uh, storage for batteries and so forth, uh, we'll see adoption. And this will create additional jobs. And with additional jobs, you'll create uh, stimulus into the economy. We'll recover a lot faster. So to, to, to us, it's going to be um, a win situation if regulators can uh, try and force this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thanks, uh, Trong and uh, Stephen. Okay. There is one question to Trung, and uh, maybe yeah. you can can join to answer as well. So this is uh, from Doni Octarizon. So it's about the uh, asking about the AI, artificial intelligence, that uh, uh, in the new normal era, oil and gas company to defy to so the, uh, the the employees should do uh, work from home. I mean, some of them also to uh, work from home, but it must follow health protocol according to uh, WHO directive. So what is the best artificial intelligence method that can be used to monitor, supervise productivity in the field? Mm -hmm. um, look, I won't be able to answer what is the best artificial intelligence uh, um, algorithm or software to be able to use to monitor on the field. 
Um, I, I think we're, we're progressing there. We're not quite there just yet. We're working with a number of clients looking at um, automated drilling rigs, uh, robotic uh, drilling arms and so forth. Um, there's, there's still a long way to go to, to look at unsupervised and beyond that um, unsupervised AI. Um, we're in a stage where um, people are getting used to, uh, you know, staying home to work. And, and if we have another pandemic, what would happen? So we have to anticipate this. And that's why I think the digital frontier is, is an interesting um, play. And if we're not already in there, we should. And if governments are not putting initiatives to, to develop capabilities in this area, I think we should. Um, this actually shows us it's more more necessary for for us to be um, able to work um, uh, out of harm's way, uh, offshore rigs onshore. Uh, but if we are now looking at um, uh, remote, uh, this will be a good opportunity for us to try it out. So I don't have the answer for the AI algorithm software. The best way is situated. Um, like I said we're working with a number of clients to look at uh, how to deal with the current situation to to uh, work remotely. Um, but we're still far away from going into um, the, the full automated and, and robotic type of drilling sense. Um, so <laughs> perhaps uh, maybe after this, I could uh, send a, a, a um, uh, an article or a quick note to to the um, participants on this question if you want. Yeah, just to give an just to give an example on that point, we uh, we recently worked for a large um, uh, a large European international company operating or developing a, a very deep water uh, oil and gas field. And it introduced, uh, it wanted to cut its capital costs, reduce its um, the complexity of its subsea operations by simplifying its umbilicals and simplifying its templates. And to do this, rather than having umbilicals and improving the economics as a result, Rather than having multiple umbilicals for chemicals, water, um, treatment, communications, it simply um, had a, uh, introduced some rather complex AI into the, the production operations uh, uh, management, temp, uh, management at the template in, in order to introduce chemicals on an iterative basis um from the from the uh, from a storage tank at the subsurface um on the seabed um and that cut down diving it cut down um rov activity it it greatly simplified operations it greatly reduced capex so a little bit of lateral thinking new thinking and the appropriate introduction of ai is definitely the way forward All right. Uh, uh, we still have a time. Uh, uh, there is a question from Agus Budipurnomo. So I believe that uh, you actually already uh, already highlighted in certain things. But this is my job to deliver some of question to you. <laughs> uh, how to improve optimization in various aspects to keep upstream oil and gas production this year remaining at normal levels, even though world oil prices have plummeted due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Sorry, Flo, what was the question again? Um, okay, so the question is that how to improve optimization in various aspects to keep upstream oil and gas production this year remaining at normal level. Mm -hmm. So even though that uh, the world oil prices is uh, uh, down and, and uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, production optimization, of course, is something that should be pursued whether prices are, are high or low. Maximizing the flow from your wells and from your platforms is always the goal of any operations manager. And if there's even a 1% reduction in utilization, or offset from peak deliverability, then that's a disaster. Um, because early oil and early cash is always so much better than late oil or late cash. Because 
you've already invested in your well, you've already invested in your surface facilities, and that's the day job. How to do the day job, of course, is the job of all of us. Um, it's about make sure, making sure that the right technologies were invested in and installed in the first place. It's about making sure that the team is properly trained. Maintenance is undergone in a timely manner. And here, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning also have a, a role to play. Um, and it's, it, it, it's about making sure that there's timely and appropriate workovers and interventions in wells. Um, but it's, yeah, more than anything else, it's about maintenance and understanding the reservoir, making sure there's a perhaps a digital twin of your reservoir that can be engineered and, and tweaked with off, offline, off-site, in the same way that uh, large automotive operators um, maintain a digital twin of their factories so that they can continuously tweak and shape and update certain aspects of their production line. Mm. The same should mm. also be happening always with all, um, with all production, oil and gas production operations. Takes some investment, of course. Um, so I don't think this whole it, this whole issue is extremely important, and I'm very grateful that, that it was brought up as a question. But I don't think that it's a necessarily a, uh, associated with COVID nineteen. What COVID nineteen may do, of course, is to act as a stimulus to introduce some of these technologies and introduce some of these ways of working and ways of thinking in order to squeeze just this little bit more from the lemon, a little bit more juice from the fruit to improve the situation. But of course, squeezing the fruit works just as well when the prices are high as when they are low. All right. Okay, uh, Trump, do you want to add something? No, no, I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for <laughs> Okay, so uh, I did my job, so there is no more question on my hands. <laughs> so, uh, so discussion is a thank you to Trong and Stefan for a good discussion. So maybe if there is uh, some of other question that uh, uh, for the moment is that uh, you you don't have in mind and then after this webinar session is over and then you have some of question in your mind uh, is feel free to send an email to us uh, yeah, so and to mail you can send an email to uh, PBSDM and the PBSDM can send an email to us and then we will happily to answer all of the question so absolutely so thank you very much so I give uh, I return back to the Master of Ceremony, Ibu Santi. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure speaking with all of you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Bapak Florentinus, Mr. Rogers, and Mr. Gate. We highly hope our discussion today will be beneficial for all of us, especially in these uncertain times. Thank you for all the participants both here in Zoom and those who stayed on YouTube channel PPS Demigas Official and Kementerian SDM. Dan tidak lupa juga kami informasikan untuk rekan Migas baik di Zoom ataupun YouTube channel yang sudah mendaftar sebelumnya, link sertifikat webinar ini akan diinformasikan di media sosial PPS Demigas. So, follow our social media ya. Dan silahkan mengisi questionnaire yang muncul di layar kaca Anda terlebih dahulu. Oke, okay, jadi rekan Migas, jangan lupa untuk follow media sosial PPSD Migas, karena PPSD Migas banyak banget program-program yang menarik, yang pasti kalian tidak akan, tidak ingin ketinggalan. Iya, berbagai program workshop, mm -hmm. training, certification, dan lain-lain termasuk webinar ini, semua kami publikasikan di Social media kami. Jangan lupa follow ya. Dan silahkan mengisi polling layanan webinar PPSDM Migas. 
Well, we still don't know how long this pandemic will last, but we need to keep our spirit up and work together as never before to face this storm. Keep healthy, stay safe, and be blessed. Once again, thank you for your participation. I'm Santi. Dan saya Nova, pamit undur diri. Sampai bertemu di program PPS DMIGA selanjutnya. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Gee. Thank yeah. you, Bapak Florentinus. Thank you. Sama-sama. Thank Hope you. we will have cooperation in the near future. Sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you.